Harriet Tubman returns overseas to capture a family during 9-11. This is your Omiinka 8, who's bringing you a satire from the real Juneteenth category, parting Omi as she gets into character, she will be channeling Harriet Tubman as Harriet Tubman returns overseas during 9-11 to capture a family that's been left behind. Let's go in and see what Harriet has to say. Now, they want me to go overseas because some family been left behind. Why didn't the colonel do it? I know I'm a colonel, but they said this is a family matter, and they want me to go over and see if I can find this family. What did they say that family's name was? The Garth family? You mean to tell me they went over to help the military, and the military left them behind? What kind of stuff and story is this? Harry always being called on to go and rapture somebody, to go and do what somebody else don't want to do. But because I'm a woman, I know about these things. This is a black family, I understand. They went over, and here's how the story went. Somebody from the government offered one of the people in the God family, I think it was the mother, they offered her a job to go abroad. At first, they tell me she said no, she wasn't going. But they kept on calling her on the phone saying, Mrs. Goss, we need you overseas to help train our women. So she finally went to her higher up, so to speak, her teacher who was a Baba Law. And she went to the Baba Law and she said, Baba Law, can you tell me? If I should take this voyage or this trip, the Bible law cast demonation to see he do OB to find out if this was her destiny. It turned out that the Bible law told her, yes, you must go. This is your destiny. This is to fulfill your destiny. You have work to do abroad to help many people. You must go. So they say Miss Garp went ahead and accepted, and she told the boss man, I will be there, and you can ship my things, and I will be there. This is what she told him. But she had an awfully eerie feeling about going, as they had to fly in two different planes to get there, part of her family on one plane and the other part on another plane. But nevertheless, they ended up in Hanau, Germany. So when they got to Hanau, Germany, they came together. There was a chaperone, a chaperone that was going to take them around and escort them. And she came up to them and said, are you the God family? And they said, yes. And she said, come on, I will take you to your hotel. But where are we staying? Well, we have to make sure that we can find an efficient place for you. So she took them on into the city of Hanau, Germany. Then she found this hotel, rather pricely, of course, rather expensive. And Mrs. Garth said, do we have enough money to cover that? She said, oh, it'll be fine. But Mrs. Garth knew that that money would run out rather fast, even though the mark system was a lot higher than the dollar in the United States. But she went ahead and accepted the hotel, knowing that they would have to move sooner or later. As the family got settled in, they unpacked their luggage, and their guy told them, I'll be back tomorrow to pick you up, to take you around, and then show you your office. Mrs. Garth had the strangest, strangest feeling about all of this. This is a brand new place and new money, different things you had to learn. And she didn't speak the language. Of course, she had to learn some of the language like, Guten Tag, Guten Tag, and meaning good morning. So she started practicing some of the language so she could be able to greet some of the Germans. So... After going to sleep the next morning, 
Their guide arrived and she knocked at the door. Come in. And as she came in the door, she said, are you ready to take your tour? I'm here, your guide, to escort you throughout the city. We'll be going to your office so you can get acquainted with some of the workers. Then they jumped in the car and everything appeared to be different because they were driving on the other side of the road and the stern wheel was all the way on the right side instead of the left side. Nevertheless, as they got to their place of expectation, the place where she was going to be working, they got there. And Mrs. Garf says, oh, my God. She felt like she was having a heart attack when she walked up the step. And every step she took, she was, ah, ah. But she contained herself when she got to the top step. And the guide opened the door and they walked in. Mrs. Garf could not step in the door. It was just too eerie. She felt something very strange. She couldn't step in the door. And the guide said, come on. Well, we're here. Come on. And Mrs. Garf said, just take it easy. I'll be coming shortly. But she thought in her mind, this might not be a good idea after all. This might not be the best place to work. She had this eerie feeling, but still she went on into the building. As she walked through the building, she said, this will be your new place of employment and you'll be working here and this is your office and your desk and you'll be working with the students and they're all in the child care center. And Mrs. Garth says, well, when will I get to meet them? She said, you'll meet them tomorrow. And then she says, okay, I'm going to take you back to the hotel. You might want to freshen up and get yourself settled in. So she took the family back to the hotel. As they went back to the hotel, she told her husband, I don't know. I had an awfully eerie, eerie feeling when I went to the door. I could barely get my breath to walk upstairs into the office. What could be wrong? He didn't say anything. I don't know. Everything seems to be different about this place. I just don't know. But then, all of a sudden, Harriet shows up. Harriet said, I'm Harriet Tubman. I come here because I understand you people need some protection. She said, I don't know if we need protection now or not, Harriet, but we'll probably be needing it. Well, I'm going to stay around, Harriet said. If you need me, here's my Number, call me on my cell phone. You know, they give me that, that, that cell phone. You can call me at any time and I'll be here to help you. I got to go over to the colonel's office now. They got to give me my assignment and tell me where I'll be staying. I came down here to make sure y'all made it here okay. Well, we made it here okay, Harriet, and we're okay. And if we do need you, we'll call you. All right, then. Thank you. Then Harriet left. Nevertheless, this family knew that they were in for a real ride. And as the next day rolled around, Mrs. Scarf got in a car and drove over to a place of employment. When she got there, she still had the same eerie feeling. It was very hard for her to open up the door to go into a place of employment. But she went in anyway. She met her boss. And her boss was a German lady. And the German lady said, Good talk. How are you? Thank you for coming. I'm glad you could come and be a part of our establishment. Mrs. Garf said, Well, I'm glad to be here. But I did have an eerie feeling when I got here. I hope everything's okay. How has everything been working here in the office? Well, the girls have been a little uptight. And they were trying to formalize their own corporation. And they want more pay. And you know how it is. It's always one thing after another because they feel they're not being adequately compensated. Well, Mrs. Garf said, we might have to look into that because everybody wants to have a raise and be compensated. So they do have their rights. Are you allowing them to gather together to talk about their needs and are you adhering to what they're saying? Well, no, because we don't have excess money in our budget to give it to them. So nevertheless, 
Mrs. Goff knew that there was going to be trouble ahead. She knew that they were already in turmoil with administration about their raises. So Mrs. Goff went in to speak to the young ladies. I am Mrs. Scarf, and I am here to help you in developing your government training because you have trainings that need to be completed, and some of you need to be registered uh, at the college, and you can do in-house training. I'll be here to help you by any means necessary. If you need something, let me know. And what are the problems that you're having now? Well, we're not getting our training and we're not getting our raises and our increases. And we have so much extra work to do. We do a lot of overtime and we're not paid for it. And there's just a problem with management. Well, that seems like a lot to try to tackle in one day. Let's just try to tackle one thing at a time and we'll address that. And we're coming up on uh, our, our, our new uh, evaluation. Well, how do you guys feel about going back to school, getting the CDA? What is the CDA? The CDA will help you get recognized for having credentials, and they will pay you additional X dollars for getting your credential. Then you can expect an increase. Well, I would love to enroll in that class, and I would too. And I would love to get my credential. Well, we have to get everything all planned out and see how we can get you enrolled in the after-school program so after hours you can come to the class. Now, Mrs. Garth knew that there was something wrong because these girls were not being adequately paid, and she knew she was in for trouble because she's going to have to act as an advocate. Nevertheless, she went back to the hotel, and eventually... They got moved to Gelhausen, and they got moved to a permanent place out of the hotel. But nevertheless, this was closer for Mrs. Garf to get to her place of employment. Upon going to her place of employment, uh, there was Harriet standing in the hallway again. Harriet said, hi, I was Harriet, and I'm here again. You met me yesterday. I'm here to make sure everything is causal and going right with all of y'all. Well, Harry, I discovered that the girls are not happy and they're not getting adequate training. And some of them feel like they're working extra overtime. Well, I'm going to tell you, Miss Guy, this place is a mess down here. I understand that they've had series of problems and they can't seem to keep any tech trainers here in this office. Every one of them seem to be leaving. But I hope You can find your home here. I hope you can turn things around because things are not going like they should be going. Well, Harriet, I'm going to need your help. I hope you do stick around so you can act as a third wheel or somebody that can actually support what I'm doing. Well, that's what I'm here for because I know we don't want to lose another good employee. And they keep on leaving, going back to the States, and they don't stay over a year. You mean they don't meet their probation? No, they don't. They don't seem to ever meet their probation. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know what's the problem. I'm trying to find that out now. What is keeping them from reaching their probation? And a number of them, they can't get the thing shipped back because they haven't met their probation. And they use that as an excuse not to ship the things back. Well, I hope they don't have any funny ideas about trying to set me up. Well, let me know. You got my phone number. Just call me because that's what my job is. I'm the colonel here and I run things. You can count on me. You can call me anytime you think something don't sound right. All right, Harriet. Thank you. Mrs. Garf goes on her day to train and work with the girls. And as the time goes by, six months roll by and she's training them. And they did enroll in that extracurricular activity training after school to get their CDA. And they were ready to get their acknowledgement and their certificates for getting their credentials and completing the hours necessary for the CDA. And the girl said, oh, we are almost done with our training. Are we going to celebrate? Are we going to do anything afterwards? Why, yes, we should have a celebration because we're graduating out of the CDA program. Can we have a banquet, Ms. Garf? Can we have a banquet? Well, I have to check with management and see if that's possible and see what's all involved in that and how much money you have to put out because 
it has to come from the department because I can't foot the bill. Uh, we're going to have to have flyers and invitations. Well, I can at least go talk to Petra and ask Petra, is it possible that we can have this banquet and can we have it here on the base? And can I send out invitations that can be done by the secretary here? And there won't be a lot of overhead because it could be the, the flyers and invitations could be done from right here and I can put them out. Uh, Petra, the girls are wondering if they can have their banquet for the CDA. And I'd like to know if I can print those uh, invitations out and flyers out right here. Well, I sure. Um, go in and talk to the secretary and make sure that she can set everything up for you. So are you sure it's okay? Yes, I'm sure. All right. Need, needless to say that after Mrs. Garth printed out the invitations and told everyone there would be a banquet, there was much to say. Later on, Petra denied she ever gave Cheryl any, any idea that she could have a banquet. She said, I never gave her an idea she could have a banquet, nor did I say that she could print those documents out. Then, she, Mrs. Garth, will you come in the office? Now, Petra wanted to cite Mrs. Garth for using government faxing and printing material to print out the invitation. Mrs. Garth said, but Petra, you told me that it was fine that I go and talk to the secretary. And the secretary printed them out. Now, you're going to cite me for printing out something on government uh, printers? And now you're trying to write me up? I think that's wrong, Petra. I really do. And Petra never said anything. But Mrs. Garth decided to call Harriet Tubman. Harriet, I want you to know I'm having some problems over here. Petra is giving me a problem when she approved me to have this banquet here on campus and to utilize the printing uh, material from the secretary's office. Now she wants to write me up. What do you mean she wants to write you up? What is that all about? What, what is going on in that office? I must come over there right away to see what's going on. And she did come over right away. But Petra gave her a song and a dance as well. At that particular point, Harriet could not say anything. She was too choked up and she left. Now, here Mrs. Garth was finding out that this department was corrupted and it had problems. And if that wasn't one problem, there was another problem and another problem. Now, at this particular point, Mrs. Garth was being detailed to work in family child care as well as the center child care. It was a great deal of work, 10-hour shifts, 10-hour shifts all day long, working over in the child care center and then leaving, going over to the family child care center in the evening and teaching classes. Now, Mrs. Garth was told if she did a good job that she would be detailed over to the family life department where she could work with the family child care. Mrs. Garth worked night and day to get the work done. Now, Harriet comes around to check on things and see how things are going. What do you mean you're working 10-hour shifts? Who assigned you these 10-hour shifts? And why are you working at the family child care now? And are you still working at the family center? Yes, I am. I'm working both places. I've been detailed. I work 10-hour shifts. What do you mean? Why is it that they got you on 10-hour shifts? This is way too much work. Well, she said she had to have someone to cover the uh, office over at the family child care, but they were going to be bringing somebody in shortly. But if I did a good job, they would just uh, take me off detail and permanently me assign me over at the family child care. And then whoever else that they hired would come in and take the family uh, center position. Well, I hope they follow through on that because this is getting a little crazy. They seem to be giving you extra work and they're not addressing the issues that you're telling them about. Nevertheless, Harriet thought she'd go and talk to the colonel. Colonel Dion, this is Hatch Cochran. I'm calling you Colonel Dion because I want you to know there's some problems that are occurring. And I want you to know that things are not being handled right. And I'm concerned, Colonel. I'm concerned because we've had a good worker come here, and in just a short time, they're already impeding on her rights, taking away her obligation to work nine to five. Now she's working 10-hour shifts. You need to look into this, Colonel. Something just doesn't sound right. 
Why is all this detail going on? And why are they spreading this young lady so thin? Uh, I'm going to keep in contact with you because I want to make sure that there is no uh, uh, partiality being shown to this girl. I understand we got some other problems with other women that are African-American as well. So why are the African-American people being pushed into working these detailed jobs? So Harriet left after speaking to the colonel. The colonel was going to look into it. In the meantime, Mrs. Gar was look was at a meeting talking to some of her uh, higher ups about job openings that were open, and they were told that they wanted to apply for certain jobs to apply. But at that particular moment, they were also told that they were bringing in some brand new hires and that they were going to. Uh, give those people who have been there the longest the chance to bid on the jobs first and give them a chance to promote. But needless that Ms. Scarf uh, realized that they had already hired these girls to come in to take those promotions and that the job that Mrs. Garth did want for family child care, they had already placed somebody there. And they uh, told them that they could bring in their own staff and they can select the people they want to keep. However, these women came in and they decided they want to bring their own staff in and that, and that they didn't want to keep any of the old workers. So they immediately tried to dismiss all of them and then came up with some flimsy excuse why they were dismissing Mrs. Garth as well. Ms. Garth called Harriet. Harriet, Harriet, can I talk to you? Uh, there's been a whole shipment of new workers coming on board. And we were told we were going to be given first choice to these openings. Now these new workers have been assigned our jobs. And they're finding false statements to eliminate my job and saying that it was misconduct and they're lying. And we're going to need you to step in. Well, that's what my job is. Finally, I get to do my job. And I'm telling you, young lady, you're not the first person that's had problems down there in that department. You're not the first, and I'm sure you won't be the last. Right now, I can count four or five girls on my finger that have already gone home that they've done the same thing to. There's going to have to be an investigation, and you're going to have to file for discrimination because this ain't right, and I'm going to back you all the way. And this is a family in distress, and that's why I was brought here, to make sure that things were done right with you. Well. They've already taken me off the job, Harriet, and I'm going to need some help. I'm going to need to contact my senator, and I'm going to need to let him know what is going on, because this is not right. Well, I talked to Colonel DeYoung. He's very pleased with your work. And as a matter of fact, they were on their way to your office to greet you and commemorate you for a job well done. But they had no idea all this stuff was going on. Well, that's what I was called down here for, to make sure that a family in distress would get some help. And I'm here for that. Well, Harry, I need to prove all these false allegations that are wrong. I need to go and talk to every one of these people that so-called made allegations. I understand that they also put out an offering of money for anyone that would give false allegations. And they pay people off to give these false allegations. You mean to tell me that they have asked some people to come forward, that they paid for false statements? Yes, they did, Harry. And they gave the statements and they used the statements against you? Yes, they did. And I'm going to prove every one of them to be a lie, Harry. I'm going to need your help. Well, you got my help because this is certainly not right. You cannot bring other outside people in to falsify information against workers. This is illegal, and we must file an EEOC charge against them. Well, Harriet, I've already beat you to the punch. I already filed my EEOC investigation, and I met with the EEOC officer this afternoon, and I already told them all of the lies and the allegations that they've created. And a matter of fact, One of the young ladies who I work with, who was one of the family child care providers, 
came to me and said they offered her money for a statement against me. She has written up a statement saying that they tried to coerce her and write, giving a statement. You mean to tell me you got a witness, somebody that's have witnessed this? Yes, I do. And I've already gone to the EEOC with this information. And she's going to EEOC herself to meet with them to tell the EEOC what calamity they're creating by going to each girl, asking them to give a testimony in exchange for a large sum of money. Why would they go this far to try to create this atmosphere? I just don't know. But we're going to get to the bottom of this because that's why I'm here. I'm here to support a family in distress. And the Gar family, you're in distress right now. And I came here to help. And I'm going to help you, even if we have to do what's necessary by taking this case all the way. Well, they won't give me my uh, orders. They said that they cannot give me my orders because I didn't fulfill the probationary period. And my probationary period won't be up until the 8th of June. And it's just the 3rd. So now I'm stuck without getting my things shipped back home. Well, I know one thing. You can call your senator. You said you was going to call Senator Feingo. You can call Senator Feingo. Senator Feingo can offer up a congressional offering to make them give you your orders. Well, that's exactly what I'm going to do, Harry. I'm going to call Senator Feingo. I'm going to ask him to help me get a congressional hearing so they can release those orders to me. So that's exactly what was done. Senator Feingold was asked to do a congressional order. He had the congressional order done, and the military had to release her orders to return home. However, she asked them, is it possible to give me an extension because my husband is working in under contract? They agreed that they could give an extension, but they took those orders and placed them on somebody's desk, and they sat there and expired. And by the time that Mrs. Goff was supposed to get those orders back, they had already expired and they claimed they could not renew them. Once again, all kinds of trickery going on. And I had to call Harriet in on the scene. Harriet said, I don't know what's going on. I don't know why they would pull something like this. They would let you work all those extra hours and promise you a promotion and then hire somebody else from the States to come down here to take y'all's job. How many of it was y'all that lost y'all job? Well, Harriet, there seems to be another manager and myself, both who weren't placed, okay? And uh, the secretary that basically was also eliminated her job. And there's been two other people. So is this a class action case? Well, I'm, I'm submitting it as a class. But how can you do that? Don't you have to ha- meet certain requirements? I hope that they'll accept it as a class. But nevertheless, Harriet, what can you do to help us? Well, I'm doing all I can to help you. I'm trying to figure out w- what is going on and why all of this distinction and this racism thing. They're, they're, they're just going to have to call it what it is, racism, because they're bringing a bunch of white girls to take your jobs, and y'all all are black women, so it's got to be some racism involved here, but we got to get to the bottom of this. Stay tuned. We'll get to the bottom of this next time. Thank you. Please join us again.